Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. I'm your host, Lisa, and I'm here today with my guest, Venkat. Hey, Lisa. Glad to be here. Cool. Um, hey, Venkat. So um, do you have a snack that you're eating today? Yes. So today is um, the letter V, so I'm eating vanilla ice cream. And oh, I put vanilla. it in a little Demitas coffee mug so I could show it to the video camera. <laughs> it looks very tasty. Very tasty. Um, what do you I, have? I have a venison dried sausage, which they sell here in Texas. Um, great. Uh, yeah. I think you did um, beef jerky yeah. for B, right? So, mm, yeah. Yeah, and B and V are very similar in many languages. So it's kind of funny. Yeah. All right. Mm, that's good. Um, Cool. Oh, great. So what do we have to talk about today, Venkat? Um, so with letter B, um, we only have a couple topics. Should we go ahead and get into them? Get into them. Okay. Um, the first topic we have is B for vaudeville. All right. Um, I think you I put think, that on there. Did you add this? I think I added this. You added that. <laughs> and I think um, we have like K-Fab and wrestling in parentheses after that, but that should probably go to W or something. So what will I think is distinct from uh, wrestling K-Fab, so we should treat it distinctly. Okay, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I think the whole concept is what, like, is vaudeville dead? Is like kind of, I think, the question I wanted to like approach. Um, and so vaudeville was like the way that people, entertainers would do small shows, mostly back in like the twenties, right? They were like small traveling shows that would go around from small town to small town and do a small theater production and make some money, move on to the next place. Um, so it's kind of like budget shoestring um, entertainment. Does that sound about correct? I mean, it sounds um, consistent with what I've read about it. I don't think I've ever actually watched uh, anything that would count as classic vaudeville. Like, uh, you know, there's the, in um, Huckleberry Finn, there's that whole scene where uh, uh, Jim uh, goes Jim with the Duke with and the, the king, king on a raft down the Mississippi and they do like vaudeville shows in different towns. So that sort of yeah. thing. And I, I think um, the early black and white comedy entertainers like Charlie Chaplin came out of that tradition to some extent, their style of humor. But I think classic vaudeville I've never actually seen any. So actually, maybe have you? Like, do you know what, like what's a typical what will? No, I, I don't. So I don't really have like a whole bunch of expertise in this particularly. Um, I think that my closest thing would be like the Charlie Chaplin film stuff, right? The slapstick kind of humor. Um, my understanding is that they're like variety shows. Um, mm -hmm. And that most of kind of what singled it out as being vaudeville is like the traveling aspect to it or like the um maybe I'm wrong about that um but I think it's kind of an interesting question to like okay maybe it's kind of weird but like sometimes I feel like you can look at things that humans have a tendency to do like so vaudevilles like entertain each other or, like budget entertainment right um and that existed like before the internet or before movies really um I would assume that like the silver screen like when movie theaters started rolling out to some extent it largely cut into the same thing that vaudeville did like i don't know why vaudeville ended yeah ended. like um, uh, if you think of like movies deriving from theater and look at the kinds of theater that existed just before movies became a thing i think there were like basically three levels there was kind of like the highbrow theater then there was kind of like the middlebrow shakespeare level theater and then there was the yeah. vaudeville uh, stuff and sometimes they mixed uh, i think there were like traditions where there would be a fundamentally serious kind of uh, drama and then there would be like um, interludes of vaudeville performances or maybe a juggling act and the intermission between two things, right? I, I just Googled it um, since, hey, we live in the age of Google, but the definition seems to be a type of entertainment popular chiefly in the US in the early 20th century, featuring a mix of specialty acts such as burlesque comedy and song and dance. So yeah, it doesn't, necessarily I think uh, the travel aspect isn't central but I think you're right it probably was a traveling kind of show just by the nature of the medium like you would have to go from town to town but it says 
mid 1890s until 1930s consisted of 10 to 15 individual unrelated acts magicians acrobats comedians trained animals jugglers singers and dancers so it's kind of like i think circus without the big tent and more like um, like a modern variety tv entertainment show right and yeah. uh, with a comedic slant yeah so yeah. okay so we are well, I guess like, so the interesting thing is like, does vaudeville exist today? It's kind of like the, like, so this is a thing that we used to do for entertainment or used to like have in small towns or whatever, but is there like a modern equivalent that we could like look at and be like, oh yeah, this is like a reincarnation of the vaudeville like experience, but um, done in like a way that maybe you wouldn't necessarily notice it as vaudeville. Like sometimes, like some aspects of Twitter kind of seem vaudevillian, especially like all the like, well, maybe that's more like stand-up comedy, but stand-up comedy is sort of like a vaudevillish thing, right? Um, uh, so I, I would say the closest is probably sketch comedy, not stand-up. So Saturday Night Live, if you look at like a, this, do you, did you ever watch much Saturday Night Live? I really hate Saturday Night Live. Okay, um, but no, okay. I, <laughs> I think then you would I've hate the What? I think you would hate Woodville then, because if you think about the structure, it's got like um, a set piece stand-up uh, routines. It's got little sketches. It's got a musical number in the middle. It's got a few musical sketches as well, uh, parodies. So it, that sounds like modern Woodville to me. And I think a big part of it is it's constructed as a variety entertainment, but in a single package. It's like you know, whatever you're looking for on the slightly comedic side of uh, things, you'll get a variety of of that stuff. Whereas if you think of something like Twitter, it's too open an experience. Like, uh, yes, your feed might accidentally contain like a funny cat meme and a couple of jokes and a couple of serious commentary threads, but it's not like put together as a package, right? So I, I wouldn't say Twitter to me does not uh, present a Wadvillian aspect with the caveat that neither of us appears to have actually ever seen genuine Wadvillian. <laughs> Well, maybe your your vaudeville curation um, Twitter, like, uh, what do you call Like, I feel like maybe if you wanted to, you could probably curate a Twitter, like, experience that was vaudevillian. Um, yeah, I think you would have to look in the mentions of particular people who have, like, sort of a vaudeville catalytic effect. Um, like, people's mentions do have a particular tone to them. Like, it's more than a single person, but it's not like open-ended Twitter with all sorts of things thrown in, right? But I think right. most people don't have, I don't know, enough uh, variety in how they catalyze conversations to be called vaudevillian. So mm -hmm. I think my mentions are probably a little vaudevillian because I'm sometimes serious, sometimes make jokes. So maybe, but I don't think there's any music in my mentions. I see, okay. Well, I mean, someone could take some of what you're saying and mix it with like another musical like act and then you have like, a, <laughs> you know. There's um, a guy actually who once did a rap song um, using some of my blog posts for the content, which kind of weirded me out. It was like, I listened to it, but I'm not a big rap fan. So I couldn't <laughs> tell whether it was good or bad. I think actually this has happened twice. I, I'm, I'm assuming. So two people have made musical things based on my content. I have no idea why or how, but okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, fascinating, Venkat. You're just an inspiring <laughs> muse to these uh, yes. creators. Uh, but I would say you are a little bit of a vaudeville act, a one person vaudeville act all by yourself because of the sheer variety of things you do, like little hacky mm, hardware projects and you've got your yeah. fiction and you've got uh, mm. I don't know, two or three different sites and stuff. So yeah, I think a modern vaudeville act would be something like you in, <laughs> on social media. One woman show. Yeah, I guess I could see that. Yeah, I, yeah, I think one woman show is probably an accurate way to describe. And it's the variety part, right? Like I'm much more of a one trick pony. I pretty much just write. I don't do much. I mean, I do this podcast with you, but basically I'm a writer. Whereas you have kind of like a variety act going uh, with lots of I other do. stuff as well. And yeah. uh, I, I think, think the more you can put it online, the more it'll become clear. Like some of your hardware stuff, it's harder to put online. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the problem with doing so many different things is that um, it's like, it, it, I don't know, I, I get overwhelmed sometimes. So like, 
how do you say, like, I've got a lot of things going inside. It's hard to keep the momentum on every thread going, um, but I try. Um, how, yeah. how do you do that? Is it like just random when you see something and the mood strikes you, you move a particular project along? I have no idea. Maybe. Sure. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, I have like a, I kind of have like this like uh, mental checklist of things I'm working through and sort of semi sort of schedules that I like rotate around on what needs to be done. So, um, so what's yeah. on the checklist right now? Like what are the active vaudevillian threads in the Lisa stage right now? Um, I'm working on house. There's like one, there's like a couple of house fix up projects that are almost done. I'm repainting the banister rail, which is taking for freaking ever. And um, I'm working on a long form book project, which I don't really talk about that much. Um, this is your book, right? Yes. Uh, have I spoiled it and revealed it? <laughs> yeah, you did, Venkat. It's okay. I don't think we've talked about it on the air before. Um, that's you haven't? Okay. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, like a, it's like one of those things I just don't like talking about because I want to finish it. Um, yeah. Like, uh, this will be motivation. Okay, what else? Um, I don't know. I mean, the fiction thing and then editing this podcast are like weekly kind of chores that come back around. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think I need to shave a dog. That doesn't really count, but like playing groomer, <laughs> like being groomer Lisa is like a thing that's like, I've kind of like, you know, I've been like shopping for fancy scissors and like I get need to get new. We were talking right before the show started about your haircut, which looks great. Um, and how you need like good clippers to get good results. So I need to get, I've been thinking about acquiring more dog grooming stuff and dog things I don't know that's not but yeah those are the things I've been thinking about doing yeah not all of them qualify as what will you act entries I think some of them are just chores <laughs> I have a bunch yeah. of chores too uh, but on I the creative the front yeah I mean if you have like a bunch of creative art projects and stuff uh, and you're kind of a little bit all over the place I think yeah a single person can be a what will act in on social media do you have anyone else on social media that you would say like appears to be on the vaudeville spectrum? Uh, your sort of male Russian counterpart in my friend's circle would be one like, um, so Artem Litvinovich, uh, I think I've shared his site with you, but uh, most mm -hmm. of his uh, stuff is hardware hacking projects, a couple of art projects. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's trying to work on a couple of fiction projects and sort of science fiction world building things. So he's yeah. got a whole bunch, but I, I think the difference is that there's no undercurrent of like uh, humor to his portfolio. And uh, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, he's fundamentally, uh, I would say on the drama end of the spectrum as opposed to the comedy end of the spectrum. Whereas with you, I think basically everything you do strikes me as slightly funny. So you're on the comedy end of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think uh, maybe Vaudeville will make a comeback because uh, a public culture. So Vaudeville, I think, is uh, it has roots in like somewhat more private community culture. Like if you go back in history, it's like small, like you said, low budget traveling stuff. And mostly it would be like villagers who all know the same stories and have the same context. And like I was reading something, I forget where I read it, but like in... Um, morality plays in the middle ages that were mostly about like biblical sort of moral lessons and stuff people would intersperse like random little variety acts and juggling and clowns and shit like that so I mean, that struck me as funny that you have that kind of variety entertainment shoved entertainment in. yeah i think this is the thing about vaudeville that i find so it, like i feel like it is like capturing it does capture a thing that humans like to do or spend time on or like a trope that seems to recreate itself across the ages for humanity like you know snl is like modern vaudeville to an extent um yep. so it's not like it went anywhere it's just like mutated um mutational thing yeah it, it's it's i think it's a close cousin to uh, journalism and the news it's like a way of reacting to current events within the context of um, sort of your life, uh, but with a sort of um, fictional and entertainment focus rather than sort of a information and sort of, um, you know, practical orientation. 
Like uh, the one big difference though, I think if you look at say something like SNL versus something like medieval, I don't know, street theater or something, the context would be very different. So medieval street theater, there wouldn't be a whole lot of news. There would be local village news. Maybe there'd be a shared context of your religion or something. And maybe mm -hmm. very big events like the, a new king is coronated or something like that. But in general, there would not be this backdrop of like a fire hose of news events to react to, right? Whereas something right. like SNL is like, I don't know, 100% reaction to stuff happening in the news cycle. So I think that element is pretty new. Like even in, like I'm thinking again of Huck Finn and uh, the shows that uh, they put on down the Mississippi. It's a mix of like, they put on little bits and pieces of Shakespeare and random entertainment. So there's not much current events going on. They're like working with inherited culture and memory, not current right. events, right? Right. It's interesting that Shakespeare got that role. Like, it's like a nod to something. I'm not exactly sure what. Like, maybe like English heritage. Like, maybe that's some amount of like colonial holdover. Yeah, I think Shakespeare is interesting because when he was working and writing, I think he would have been sort of commoner theater. Like, even yeah. though there was a lot of like stuff about royalty and stuff, it was for the common people. And then it became kind of like slightly highbrow culture. But when it got imported into the U.S. as part of like, you know, Shakespeare in the Park type uh, culture, it got a little bit democratized again. But the scenes in Huck Finn are pure vaudeville. Like these people don't know how to do Shakespeare. Their mastery of Shakespeare is very poor. So they're like, I'm doing act three, scene two from Richard the Fourth or something like that. And it's a mess and the crowd boos at them and like throws tomatoes at them or something. So they, it's played for laughs in Huck Finn. But I can imagine yeah, that I would agree. be true. I can imagine that a very sort of uh, a bastardized and um, sort of crappy version of Shakespeare would be included in Wadwell. Yeah, but I don't know. It's just interesting that Shakespeare like made that leap to like the commoner. Like the this is like we want to protect. Like this is like how we signal that we're doing fancy theater in like a lowbrow manner is by saying that we're doing Shakespeare. Um, uh, you're now reminding me of stuff like uh, back when I was in grade school, we used to do an annual sort of entertainment thing for the teachers. It was, um, I think, September 5th or I'm forgetting even the date now. I think September 5th is Teacher's Day in India uh, mm. randomly. So it's kind of like a half holiday. You don't have a regular classes, but the students yeah. put together uh, like a two or three hour long show for uh, the teachers. And it would be a variety act. Somebody would sing, somebody would put on a play. Our class would usually put on a play. And I often wrote that play. And usually it would be like a junky, like a series of like slapstick jokes woven around like uh, uh, something like Shakespeare. Like I remember one thing I wrote was uh, basically a rip off or a rip off of uh, Merchant of Venice. So Merchant of Venice plot taken over and like uh, with modern elements thrown in and like contemporary jokes thrown in. So that that would be sort of a Huck Finn vaudeville version of like Shakespeare appropriated for, you know, laughs. Yeah, Venkat, I didn't know you were a playwriter. <laughs> oh, I have a little bit of a theater background. Like in high school, uh -huh. I used to, I think two or three times I wrote the annual sort of um, production for my class. And then in college, I was actually the theater secretary for my hostel. People don't know this about me, but uh, I've won a couple of best actor awards um, in multiple languages and a best director award just within intramural, what, what in the US would be called intramural theater. So, oh, I see. Yeah. That's impressive. Okay. Yeah. So, so putting on productions I, is like a thing you have experience in. Yes. So uh, I've both acted and directed stuff. And for a while, I thought I had some talent for the, that stuff. Then I realized I have no talent for it. I just have the confidence to be on stage, which puts you above like 99% of people. Like most people freeze up when they get on stage. I don't freeze up. So that's enough in like a, you know, this was an engineering university. It was not like liberal arts with a strong talent base in like cultural production. So it was a very low barrier to pass. And because I could get up on stage and just like repeat lines I had rehearsed, that was enough to make me a good actor. <laughs> Huh. But, but I wasn't too bad. I was okay, but definitely not talented in that department. I see. But you had like the, you had the basic base layer stuff to at least like make it on. Yeah, I mean, I can script basic stuff. I can structure a scene. I can like act a scene. I can like throw in jokes. Uh, 
I can do the basics, but that's like the the bar the bar is very low for that stuff. Like many YouTube stars today, they're like really mm-hmm. impressive. Like uh, I'm amazed at like you know 14, 15 year olds who, who put on like amazing stuff. So yeah, there it isn't much to brag about. It's just a part of my life at some point. I see. So at one point you did participate in semi vaudevillian activities. I did, except for this. I think once as an eight-year-old, I might have like sung in a chorus or something, but singing mm. has never been part of my shtick, but everything else, whereas singing, I think is the core of your shtick, right? You, you do singing. Choral do singing? I yes, do I do. I mean, I'm not in a chorus right now. There aren't bars on a thing that's happening right now. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I get weird about singing. I am one person who, whenever I have to like sing, and things. I definitely get stage fright and my voice disappears and it's embarrassing. Um, but you've done it. Fine. There's some old movie, I can't remember exactly it, like, but it, like one of the like small um, side plots is there's like a father-in-law who's a really beautiful singer, but he can only produce good sound when he's in the shower. So like the end of the movie, he like gets some like big contract to go sing. You know, someone hears him in the shower and then he gets like a big part in the thing and he can't do his piece because he's got terrible stage fright. So like that last scene, they like roll him out onto the stage in a shower. Um, so he's like singing from the shower on the like stage doing his part or whatever. Um, I get, but this is like, I, the movie was not at all about this. This is just kind of like one of those side like, threads. Yeah. Like a larger film. I can't remember what it was, but it's good. Um, yeah. All right. I think we've sort of tapped out vaudeville. Um, oh, I, I want to mention one more thing though. Uh, I just rewatched uh, Little Miss Sunshine um, last weekend. Have you ever watched that movie? I think so. Is it about pageants? It's got like yeah. So it's that little girl too. who gets into the pageant. It's one of the most hilarious. So that would be, I think, vaudeville in movie form. So it's sort of a story within a story, right? So the little act that the little girl gets to go into, that's like the actual core. But the entire movie itself is kind of like a vaudeville. It's like five or six characters with their own like little comic stories playing out. Anyway, so I just wanted to mention that since I just watched it. All right, what's yeah. our next week topic? Our next topic I'm very excited about is virtual reality or VR. Otherwise VR, known as- yes, yes, yes. Um, I've been wanting to talk to you about this. I feel like we've like kind of been like hinting at your like mansion project and stuff, um, <laughs> but we've always been putting, I feel like we've kind of like been pushing it off a little bit till we got to VR or maybe we talked about it a bunch in mansions. Um, but do you have an update for us on the mansion project? Like you're, you said you wanted to get into VR and stuff. Yeah, so um, I'm, I've been looking into that, like what would like to back up, uh, I sort of have this uh, thing I do on Twitter around like uh, pretending I want, I'll, I'm working towards getting myself a mansion. Of course, in yeah. the real world, that's unlikely to ever happen. This two bedroom apartment is as close as I'll get to a mansion. But in VR, all bets are off. Like you can um, do lots of fancy stuff. And I am like actually quite impressed. Uh, I think you can actually see my Oculus sitting in the background over there. And Mm -hmm. oh, uh, Oculus is coming out with a new version of the Quest, I think. But yeah, it's, uh, I think the technology is pretty good. Like when I first saw an Oculus, I think in 2015, it was um, still pretty janky, but it's come along a long way. And then you've got the HTC Vive. I've seen uh, on the AR front, uh, I've tried both the Magic Leap and uh, the HoloLens from Microsoft. So the technology is getting there, right? And um, I've enjoyed everything I've tried in VR so far. And the biggest constraint actually, and the re- one of the reasons for this move was I couldn't carve out a six and a half by six play area to properly use my uh, Oculus Quest in my old apartment. So now I have this whole second bedroom to myself as my office and have like an eight by eight area so I can like run all the Oculus apps properly. So yeah, I've been enjoying myself. It's, um, I so when you, you use VR now, are you just playing games that other people have written? Are you? Oh yeah, pretty much. I, I play games and I ha- there's a couple of like art and sculpture type uh, programs I bought that I've been like experimenting with. I think one is called Gravity and the other is called Tilt Brush maybe. Uh, but yeah, so you can, they're pretty good. And uh, I think though to truly do like construction in VR, like, you know, if I wanted to create a virtual mansion for myself, 
uh, sculpting within VR is probably not the right way to go. I'd have to do something like you did, which we talked about last time, which is build a mansion in SketchUp and put it into a format that Oculus can read, put it on like an open VR website and then go visit it on my quest, right? Uh, you're nodding like you've done that. Have you done that? No, but I'm just imagining it. It sounds fabulous. Like I have a lot of fun doing SketchUp stuff. So just even thinking about building like a virtual house sounds like a lot of fun. Do you happen, I know you've done VR because you've posted on Twitter about like uh, VR demos, but do you own a VR device? No, I don't own one. Um, I, uh, so I've done, what have I done? So in SF, there was this like VR, I don't know, if, VR Urban Safari is what they call themselves. It's mm -hmm. a, um, it's like a place you could go and rent the VR gear or like basically you go play on VR gear for like an hour or two. Um, so I went with my uh, friend and we did a few like games. It was fun. It was like fun two-player stuff. Um, I, we did like the zombie thing that was terrible. I hated it. It was like scary. I couldn't like, I'm just so clumsy with like reloading my gun in any shoot. doesn't matter what the shooter game is. Like any shooter game where you like have to reload your gun, I'm terrible at. I'm also a very bad shot. So like the whole thing like zombies just attacked me and it was like up in your face and they like came at you and then you were like it was bad anyway it's, it's not fun my friends like, I haven't yet tried like the hey zombie back movie. up here and i'm like i'm dead my gun's not working it hasn't worked for the last five minutes i can't figure out how to reload it like yeah um but that was like fun so we did that and like the toll brush stuff um and then the other one the one that i had a lot of fun on i can't remember the name of it it's some startup i want to say like sandbox vr or um i think i've heard of that yes i saw it at some conference there was a boot it's amazing and the thing about theirs it's so cool is like they really try to do like i would almost like it's like cinema cinema it's got like cinema-esque quality to it. So I went with some coworkers right before I moved out of SF. Um, so there's one down in like the valley somewhere. And um, we had so much fun, we like stayed and played another one. Um, Cause you get like, it's like four of you and you can see each other. So it's like group stuff and they put on haptic vests and you have like real life guns. So it's, they're both, of, both all the games okay. are like shooter games, which <laughs> I like came in last on every single one and like my, all male coworkers are like, Lisa, good job. I'm like, thanks guys, it's fine. I know I'm bad at shooting things. That's good uh, Wadville credentials though. Wadville stars have to be the slapstick uh, <laughs> losers of like competitive things. <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, I was, I was comedic foil sort of, I don't know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, have you tried Beat Saber? That's the, I think, uh, game that everybody thinks of as the, Killer app. So, oh yeah. So if you, uh, A, I think you should buy an Oculus Quest. I think you'd love it. And B, if you buy an Oculus Quest, season two can, we can do stuff in VR. We can do our podcast okay. in VR. That would be yeah, fun. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah. Yeah, because it's there's the social like apps that. where you can hang out uh, sort of in 3D and we can invite people to hang out with us in like a room and do that kind of stuff. So there's, uh, okay. okay. Uh, but that aside, yeah. So shoot up i think a lot of the initial stuff is it's like you know we were talking about uh, early movies got a lot of inspiration from vaudeville which was you know the version of theater that lent itself best to movies like this seems to happen like if there's a preceding tradition typically the lowbrow thing from that tradition becomes sort of the core of the next thing so you know when uh, uh, radio became a thing there was classical music and sort of pop music available and radio became a pop music medium. Same thing with movies. There was like, you know, highbrow theater and lowbrow theater available, but lowbrow theater is what turned into movies. And I think for VR, the um, sort of uh, genealogical relationship is to 2D video games. And uh, first person shooters, I think are like sort of the least common denominator things. Mm -hmm. So that's where VR is starting out. Uh, uh, but there is like, more There's high, like I mean, so like the um, high art, high artists are making VR like exhibits. So like I, I went to the um, New Museum Triennial a three a couple of years ago, and they had a number of pieces that were VR pieces. Um, oh yeah. So I think like the high art, I think it's like I think it's both high brow and low brow. Like the ones that will get mass spread everywhere is like the shoot 'em ups, like basically like laser tag, but in VR, 
Whereas like there's definitely like high art production, there, it just won't get distributed the same kind of like indie films, right? It's it's partly that, but also partly a kind of like snobbish expectation of like the uh, old media. But I've been to an, uh, one of these um, museum kind of virtual things too, like uh, VR artwork and stuff. But there's an attitude of sort of, uh, I don't know, presumptuous snobbery to it uh, that I think fails to adapt to a new medium. And the new medium, even though some of the, what starts off is like, uh, uh, I don't know, low quality, low brow, low intelligence stuff, what grows from there need not be actually that way. Like uh, one of the best games in VR I've played is by the makers of a series of games I really liked on the iPad uh, called The Room. So the room is a series of escape room, kind of like puzzle. Uh, I love the genre. So it's like, there's this little box you'd open up, you zoom in, zoom out. So the zoom is, there's like four iPad games for it. They're all wonderfully produced and really, I would call them like, not necessarily high art, but it's like the HBO style, like high production values, really richly imagined games. And I love that. And I was just waiting for it to come out on VR and it did. So there's a, now a VR game for the room. And the whole thing is like, you're in this um, haunted mansion type uh, setting with like Egyptian mummy. So it's like being in the movie, The Mummy. And you have to go solve an Egyptian uh, mummy mystery. And it was, it's amazingly well, well done. Awesome. I mean, it sounds, it sounds incredible. Is it horror-esque? It sounds semi-horror. No, it's not horror-esque. It's, like uh, it's not scary it. like, um, okay. no, it's not like, the, there is a mummy that sits up out of a coffin or something, but it's not scary. It's like more like the mummy movies. It's not like a zombie movie. Most no, of it is it. like uh, ancient archeological puzzles kind of thing. Like, you know, a box with like a secret code that you have to figure out and enter. So it's really well done. I think that's kind of where a lot of the promise is because this first person shooter thing, I think is actually going to be hard to make work really well because it's so much richer. Like, uh, like one game I haven't yet fully tried is uh, Super Hot. Have you seen that game? So Super um, Hot is a mix of first person shooter and uh, fighting game. So the, it's like very stylized uh, noir kind of, um, you know, 1920s, 30s detective movie kind of stuff. Like uh, uh, what do you, Philip Chandler kind of stuff. But it's like very stylized stuff. It's not real characters. It's like outlines and like red and um, blue kind of like stylized characters. And you get to like punch and fight and kick and shoot and run down hallways and stuff. So it's, uh, it's first person shooter thinking, but like really imaginatively expanded into the 3D domain. So I think that's one kind of direction to look out for. The room and sort of intricate puzzlers that exploit 3D fully, that's another to look out for. Um, Beat Saber is kind of interesting. I think that's clearly the biggest hit, but it's, uh, if you haven't played, I recommend it, but the basic premise is there's, um, it's set to music and uh, things come at you like objects, little cubes with arrows pointed on them. And you hold a couple of lightsabers like from Star Wars and you have to slash at the things as they come at you. And it's really surprisingly fun. And it's sparked the whole genre of such games. And I just tried another one, which is called uh, is it supernatural or something like that, but it's uh, it's an exercise and fitness thing where they take this sort of saber premise and turn it into like a whole cardio fitness routine with mm. a lot of upper body and then you have to do a lot of lunges and like squats uh, while wielding the sabers. It works really well. It sounds like a workout. It definitely sounds like a workout. And it's a fun workout. I, I'm not normally one for like you know aerobic cardio workouts. They bore me, but this is kind of fun. Uh, but what I'm really excited about is this is still in the like, you know, walled garden stage of VR. Like in the early 90s, you had CompuServe and AOL era of internet. There was no such thing as the open internet, really. And then at some point, Netscape came along and you had the open internet and anybody could build a website and you could go visit websites. We are on the cusp of that with VR, I think. Like that's kind of why I'm interested in things like, hey, can I maybe build my own mansion and put it up on a website and people can come visit me there and can we build other stuff Would, will everybody have like a home page in vr that you can kind of browse to oh i should also mention this apartment hunting i did in the last couple of months we actually went to a bunch of those in vr so it turned out pretty practical so many of them are not doing physical tours right now so we literally went in the so the apartment i'm in right now we actually viewed this in vr 
before renting it. So I'm living in the future were you, here. Were you able to use the VR headset that you have to view it? Yes. Or did you have to yes, I, I was able to. Video? Yeah. Really so this was like, we initially visited this apartment when we were first looking, then we looked at a bunch of others, then we decided this came, became available again. So we wanted to look at it again, but then we said, we don't want to go back for another visit. Let's just see if they have a VR thing. And they did. So we went on VR and I was like, yeah, this is good enough. It's good enough to make a decision. So let's go apply. And mm -hmm. uh, I think this is going to be, this is good enough now that it's going to be the future for like you know, your realistic VR stuff. I think architectural firms have been getting into VR stuff for clients, like high-end one for a few ne for years now. Ugh. Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, the person who got me into interested in VR is a friend of mine, uh, Megan. She works for Gensler, which is one of the top two architecture firms, and she's here in LA. And she's built a career for herself, becoming the VR evangelist for Gensler. So she now goes around being the VR person on a lot of panels and conferences. And she got her start, I think. Five or six years ago, she was one of the first persons at her firm to get excited about VR and AR. And she sort of uh, coded up her own janky little AR app where you have like a little playing card size with a QR code and like a little design. And if you like point your phone at it, it pops up like an AR building. And that kind of got her into the game. And now she's kind of like a big wig in the Gensler VR scene. So yeah, architecture is definitely going big on VR, I think. We should invite her to come hang out at your VR mansion when we do our Scorpio season. Yes, uh, Megan for m Yeah, we can, yeah. We should bring her on next time. Cool. Yeah, that sounds like fun. Um, but, uh, yeah, so uh, what's the progress of your bathroom expansion uh, project that you were building on SketchUp? Yeah, I think, um, I, I mean, I have the sketches done, basically. The CAD stuff is done. Um, I think the big part now is feasibility study. So, you know, I've got the plan. The feasibility is since it's on like the third floor, figuring out where all the pipes are and if I can reroute them to the places I want them to go would be like step two mostly. Um, it's actually kind of funny. Um, my So my existing bathroom is functional clearly, um, except I woke up today and discovered that the bathtub had a leak. So I'm gonna do some minor advanced demolition um, today to try actually take the thing apart to like fix it. My dad's actually on his way up, so I might have to log off in a little bit. Um, but yeah, so uh, I think the demolition is proceeding ahead of anything else. So like, I'm gonna take it apart. Sounds like you're looking um, forward to breaking. Yeah, I don't know. I think like this is like kind of the part that I have trouble with is like translating the plan into reality, right? It's like I've got this like very high fidelity drawing of what I want to happen. And now it's like this kind of like, well, what's the next step? Like there's no button on SketchUp that's like send to local contractor or like, you know, like get quotes or like there's no like the, like the how to take the next step is like not straightforward necessarily. I mean, I have some ideas about how to do it, but um, yeah. And, and I think uh, the limitation with things like SketchUp is you can do like basic, like uh, external like design of how you want it to look like the end product of the design. But if you want to do things like laying out pipe and electrical wiring and check for like compliance and stuff, it can't do any of that for you, right? So you have to rely on other tools or other people to do that. Yeah, and like, I mean, the real problem with the existing space is I don't, I'd ha I really think I'd have to like rip into walls and stuff to find out where the existing stuff even is. So like it's easy enough to like measure all the rooms to get the measurements into SketchUp. Um, but the process of like dis the discovery, it really is like a discovery of like, I mean, I have, I have a pretty good idea of where existing pipes run and so I'm kind of trying to like do that, but I don't know enough about like um, how much of a, like how big is the floor space? So how far can the toilet be from X so that the things at the right slope and all of that. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff. Um, hey. We have your dog as a guest uh, on today's episode. Huh. Uh, so are you planning to bring on a contractor to help with this stuff or are you going to like make this yet another uh, what will figure out project where you like hit yourself on the head with a hammer and it's a comic show? It's going to be a comedy. I think we're going to have some comedy. I think, I mean, what I'd like to do is hire a plumber to help get all the lines in the right places and an electrician to get all of the light switches in the right place. But I think most of the demolition and really, I mean, I do kind of want to lay all the tile myself. I don't know why I'm probably going to hate myself, but um, yeah, I don't know. 
Where does this handy woman instinct come from? Are your parents uh, sort of handy like this, like taking on difficult home improvement projects by yourself? I would never do this. My parents are. Yeah, my parents like renovated our our, like kitchen and stuff when we were kids. Okay, so it runs in the family. Oh yeah, it's definitely a family thing. 100%, yes. Um, I'm willing to do like small repairs and like, uh, you know, things that fit on my desk size projects and maybe Ikea furniture assembly. I, I need to go by, to Ikea and buy a kitchen island and assemble that. That's going to be an annoying thing I have to do. But I don't enjoy it. And at some point I hit my limit. And one of my sort of growth uh, goals is to learn to enjoy it, which is I, I know I can kind of do it if I'm forced to, but I want to learn to do it in a way that I actually enjoy it because it feels like I'm missing out on something. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I do have some good recommendations of where to get. Um, if, if, you, if you don't want to go the IKEA route, um, I'd be happy to help you find a kitchen island that you can order through the mail. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, I, I think we should um, move on to our next topic, though. Um, yes. Because I kind of want to talk about the fourth one, but we should get to the third one before we get to the fourth one. Oh, actually, this okay. is a good segue. Um, our next topic is values. So it sounds like you're talking about how you value the DIY spirit, but you don't like participate in it yourself mostly. Is that like yeah, I, I think I'm conflicted about that. I think I think I should, I feel like I should want to value DIY stuff more than I value it. Like I want to value it, uh, but I'm basically like a lazy 20th century style consumer. Like I, my main value is convenience. I think this is something that uh, uh, we're starting mm-hmm. to come to terms with um, all over the world in the middle class, which is we are all so used to convenience and not really doing anything much beyond like consuming things. Like we are all very narrow producers and very broad as consumers. And DIY spirit, I think, is trying to become broad and shallow as producers as well. And uh, I think I, I like the idea of that, but there's like big question marks around a lot of it um, for me. Like some of it honestly seems to me kind of like, uh, I don't know, slightly pre- a precious, uh, hipstery, I don't know, snowflakey attitudes about, ooh, I'm rejecting the evil consumerist economy and corporate stuff and I'm going to build my own hand-built wooden furniture. So I kind of hate that ethos a lot. So I'm much more practical and you're nodding like you are, you love that. Yeah, I don't know. I just like knowing how it works, I guess. Um, No, that's different. That's different. I'm talking about like, are you, would you count yourself in the subculture that is into DIY because of rejection of like mainstream consumerist attitudes and corporations and stuff like that? I don't think so. Okay, that's good because if you did, we'd be enemies. Uh, but yeah, I'm like, I like the idea of like accepting and enjoying everything the big corporate consumer world produces for us, but having more agency over it, like being able to repair it, fix it, build my own things out of it. So I like that idea. So like I have, I was just tweeting a couple of days back about I have this box of like used electronics junk, like cables and other crap. And I was really happy. I just got this used telescope from a friend on Twitter and that was missing a power supply. So I scrounged around in my box of like old cables and power supplies. And I found one that worked 12 volt, two amp. And I like that kind of thing. So where you're like in the heart of the industrial ecosystem, you're not pretending to be, you know, a 12th century person making everything out of wood for yourself and rejecting modernity like the Amish. I don't want that. So like, but it sounds like what you accomplished was a little bit of scavengery. Like you did yes. a little bit of like a scavengerish like. That's okay. exactly it. Like I think I tweeted this two days ago that I one of my new ambitions is my mansion should have a junkyard in the backyard. So my okay. mansion will have an attached junkyard. I I really like the junkyard ethos. Okay, gotcha. So you want to be scavenger Ben Cat? Yes. Yeah, next season we should tr- do something with that like maybe each week we each bring a show and tell scavenged part like hey here's a little old transformer i found mm, okay yeah. would you call yourself more scavengery or something else yeah i think i'm more of a scavenger but i don't i don't know i think like i don't have quite enough like pack rat ishness but i do enjoy utilization 
like high like, there's a certain amount of like utilization like metric that goes along with scavenging and i think that that i value that a lot um yeah utilization is a funny thing like hold on I, i'm going to bring something to show and tell give me 10 seconds okay okay so this is my show and tell what do you think it is it looks like a cardboard tube venkat but long it's like it's a, well, I'm describing it for people who aren't maybe watching it. It's, uh, it's about 10 inches long, cardboard to maybe quarter inch thick, well, and three inch diameter. Yeah, okay. you underestimated the length. It's more like 14 inches uh, with like a three inch diameter. Uh, this is the cardboard, uh, it's like a toilet paper roll, except it's inside the saran wrap thing that movers use. Uh, so it's like big rolls of like the wrappy thing they use for furniture. So when we move the movers, uh, use like three of these to wrap our furniture and other crap uh, to move to a new apartment. And whenever I see something like this, it sort of pushes one of my buttons really hard, which is, this is like such a lovely piece of something, right? It's like beautifully geometric. It feels like it should be useful, even though it's like waste junk from like a used thing, like the uh, saran wrap type thing is gone. But like, I, I, they were going to throw away these three rolls, but I took them and I do this all the time. Like anytime I see something that has like, a kind of like, I don't know, geometric elegance to it and looks like it should be useful. I have your same, like you, you were talking about utilization. You like to see things utilized and stuff. Uh, I'm that way too. And I'm that way about like, you know, odds and ends that aren't necessarily utilitarian in that sense. Like when I saw this, I was like, this is a really nice just cardboard tube that feels like I should be able to do something with it. Like, you know, make a telescope or a kaleidoscope or a microscope or something. So I'm, I'm saving them for when I think of, this is by the way how I ended up with the telescope. I got this cardboard tube and I was like tweeting about, hey, where can I find like a three inch lens to make a telescope out of it? I did some research, found that it's actually really hard to find lenses of that size. You can get bigger or you can, it's like complex reasons. So it turns out turning this into a telescope is not a very practical project. But while I was tweeting, somebody tweeted a reply, a friend of mine and said, hey, I have a used telescope I'm not using. Would you like that? And he shipped it to me. So I have that now. And one of my projects now is doing stuff with that telescope, like adapting it to take astrophotos. But yeah, so this already has paid off. But yeah, I still want to do something with this. I don't know what the hell it is, but these are my values. When I see something like this, I want to do something with it. Mm, I see, yeah. All right, so that's my value story. What are your values? I have no idea. Oh, I think I like, I'm a collector. I think I recently like fully embraced like collectorism. Um, okay. Like, I don't know exactly what that means exactly, but I like, I guess I like, I like getting a good value. I feel like I like collecting things that feel valuable um, and like not overpriced sort of. So like, you know, I, I recently collected an old 16 year old car, which I really like driving around. Um, I get a lot of value out of having this like old car that I'm gonna fix up and it needs maintenance work. And like, um, you know, the house like needs maintenance work. I gotta redo the bathroom, um, but then it'll be, the house will be worth more than when I had it because I did all the maintenance work or something. Um, huh. So a little bit you have not, like I have scavenger values, like clearly this is a scavenged object. Yeah. Whereas you I think have flipper values. You like taking like yeah. things that can- yeah, I, I wouldn't call that collector though. Like you like looking at like undervalued things that with a little bit of work could turn into high value things. So it's like flipping houses, flipping cars. A little hmm. bit, but I mean, it's not so much flipping as like, I mean, I like having them. It's not like I buy them and sell them, but I think I am really good at spotting things that have that potential. Okay, but it's always this kind of utilitarian stuff or do you also have a collector's eye for like paintings and rare craft I've objects and stuff? I've been buying a lot of rare books. I just bought my first painting. Um, I'm really excited about nice. it this last week. It'll be here. I'll like definitely put it in the background on the next one. I'm really excited about it. Um, what about like uh, antiquing, which is uh, I, think, uh, I think of as junkyard hunting partly like, did you ever watch uh, Antiques I Roadshow, that show? Yeah, I've seen that a little bit. I mean, when I'm trying to like source furniture, I guess I don't really go. Furniture is such a hard thing to buy secondhand. Like I did most of the, I saw I furnished that apartment, the big apartment I lived in in San Francisco, I basically furnished. I spent like, I spent a lot of money furnishing that house. Um, as they, it like paid off sort of. And that when I moved to my house here, I like brought most of it with me and I didn't have to 
buy a lot of furniture because it all just kind of fit in different places. Um, so that was really nice. But um, I spent a lot of time on Craigslist and like one like one afternoon rented a big like U-Haul truck by myself and drove around town picking up Craigslist furniture for like an entire day. Um, I'm such a me. I feel like sometimes I feel like I'm such a maniac. I'm like, who runs a U-Haul and like goes and picks up like 10 different pieces of furniture from different things. It was a scheduling <laughs> nightmare too. It was a little bit of logistics thing. And it's just me. Like, you know, and the person who's selling the stuff is like, oh, it's just you. I'm like, yeah, could you help me put it in my in our truck and like pull it open and like we try and shove the stuff in with like whatever else I've got in there for the day. Um, I have no I've idea. I've sold how stuff I, like, to people to, like, like you. Stuff. Like uh, sometimes when we list things on eBay and uh, they come to collect it, it's somebody like that who's rented a U-Haul or something for a day. And when I help them carry it down and they open up the back, it's like, oh, you've been doing the rounds. You've got like six other things in there. Huh. But I think we're working towards season two being some version of like a house hunters or some <laughs> antique roadshow kind of uh, show. <laughs> the road, like, yeah. Except we are virtual and on Zoom, so there's a limit to what we can do. But maybe we can go junkyard dumpster diving online or something. Yeah, that would be uh, fun. Online junkyarding. Online junkyard. There's um, a lot of people who do that, like go into obscure forums and dumpster dive for weird shit. But, but, but I think... Yeah. The dig digital version is not as much fun. There's something fun about dumpster diving and junkyard diving and physical The physical stuff. aspect of it's really nice, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, what you, the way you describe your collector instinct actually reminds me of uh, Pablo Neruda. So when I visited Chile, I got a chance to visit his house. So in, well, what's that, uh, Valparaiso, there's, it's a tourist attraction, uh, Pablo Neruda's house. And he was a famous collector. Like the tour is basically, oh, Neruda collected this table at some point and this thing at some point. And every object in that house has like a story attached to it. And I was like, this is the freaking opposite of me. I like objects that work for me and I enjoy using or working with, but I don't want my shit to have stories. I want no, me to have I, a story. I want storage shit. I love storage shit because it's just like, you can like trace the thread of each thing and it's kind of like all these threads that end up in the same place. I don't know, it's fun. Yeah, um, and that puts you in sort of the expensive real antique hunting kind of stuff because the older yes. an object is, the more it's likely to have a good story, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but like, I mean, so I don't know. Like, one of the books I got recently that I'm excited about, I haven't read it yet. It's like a first edition copy of The Thing by G.K. Chesterton. And the reason that I got it is because it's the book in which he like um, outlays Chesterton's fence. So it's like a memento, it's like got like, it's got cultural valence because of like how Chesterton's fence became like a thing that is well known in certain internet circles. So it's like this like cool kind of like artifact of um, like origin the origination thing, I don't know. Hmm. And though just looking at what's visible of your room around you, you've got like a couple of photographs and a painting of some sort up on an easel. All of that mm -hmm. stuff looks pretty new. So you don't yet have a Pablo Neruda level of like storied no. fitting of your house, Not right? Yet. Like furnishing well, of your house. Yeah. But you're headed there. You have a 16 year old car, so it's a start. That's yeah. long enough to have a story. Yeah. 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 Some stuff is, about... There's a cycle of like stuff which is new is kind of like has no story. There's no story to a two year old Ikea dresser or something. Then it goes through a period where it's junk, but then you wait long enough, it, beco it becomes storied. Like even an Ikea furniture, 20 years, if you keep it for 20 years, it probably will have collector value. Like they'll probably retire the design. Maybe, I mean, it kind of depends, right? Like I definitely bought IQ furniture that was a collector's item on accident. Like when I went to sell it, it was great because this is a nice thing about IKEA furniture having moved as much as I have. Um, and maybe you've experienced this also. Um, when the great thing about IKEA furniture is that it's resale value is amazing. Um, mm -hmm. People like look out, like. Like people like actively hunt for IKEA certain like styles and stuff. So like, um, I don't know. Like I had a, a kitchen counter once actually that I I was IKEA and they discontinued it and it was a great. I mean it was a great layout or whatever. And so when I would sell it, like I got like immediate offers for maybe even more than I was offering it for because it was like rare. Um, whereas most stuff that you buy off of like Wayfair or other. Um, 
like other kind of like not Ikea, basically any furniture thing that's not Ikea, even really expensive stuff, you can't make the money back on. Like you just don't get, yeah. you get like a tiny fraction of what you paid for it. Um, whereas like yeah. stuff tends to like kind of have like a resale value sort of. We should talk about furniture in more detail under F at some point. I think there's there's a lot of depth there. Like Ikea is like some, there's something, they've discovered some sort of magic formula about sort of, you know, postmodern furnishing um, mysteries where they, they know something that, you know, old school furniture makers don't. So I'm kind of interested in diving in more into it. But okay, huh. So we discovered a lot about our values. So we share a certain amount of junkyard values and you have flipper values. And we both agree people who reject modernity and consumerism are kind of annoying. Snowflakey. To an extent, I don't know, but yeah, a little yeah. bit, maybe. Um, should we talk about Yeah, thoughts? I like people who do that, but do it so damn well that you have to admire them. Like I think we talked about uh, George uh, Dyson, the son of Freeman Dyson, who built um, uh, Bidarka canoes based on like old Native American designs. Now, if you're going to do like anti-modern, like retreat from the consumer economy, do DIY stuff, you got to go that deep. You, you got to like really master some really ancient thing and do a great job with it. Not like some annoying little lifestyle in Portland or something. So anyway, ah, all right. So what's the last V topic? Last V topic is vaults. Um, vaults? Okay. Which uh, I kind of wanted to bring it up. Well, it's kind of a Bitcoin. So I've been thinking about it from like the Bitcoin perspective, um, mm -hmm. which I find because I find them like interesting. Um, I think it also, I think you can tie it into values and a little bit of VR. Um, so like a Bitcoin vault, for those of you who aren't familiar with them, and honestly, like I don't know as much about this topic as I would like to. I think it's like actually kind of like a fairly complex niche um, subcategory of like topics in cryptocurrency um which i think like bitcoin probably has the most advanced stuff on than any other currency just because bitcoin's like big enough to have all these little like sub niche mm -hmm. corners people spend time in um but like so the concept with a vault is that it's like a smart contract that is hard to get money out of because of the way it's written when you spend it when you spend money that's written to this vault contract, there's a certain amount of time that you have for um, someone else to claw it back. So if I were to like send you money, let's say like a, so the whole purpose is that if a scammer, not a scammer, yeah, a scammer, if someone managed to get access to your keys and is able to um, send money out of your wallet to an address that you don't want it to go to, you have a certain amount of time before you can like, pull it, claw it back to yourself. So it's like a vault because it's got a several like almost like antechamber that the money moves to. And then while ah. it's in that antechamber, you have an opportunity to return it to the vault before um, you lose it forever. Um, and like a lot of people, vault technology gets talked a lot around people who like escape planning and like, oh, I have a lot of Bitcoin. I want to make sure that my heirs can get it. Or I want to make sure that like all of my money that's like I have so much Bitcoin, I want to put it in like a cold storage wallet and make it very hard to get out um, because they have so much Bitcoins that they never want to lose. Um, but vaults kind of end up in these like interesting, um, you kind of end up in like, so the thing with a vault is that if you end up in the antechamber because someone you haven't, you don't want to spend your Bitcoin has been able to spend it. Um, and it's kind of in this like clawback period, you can get to these really weird like, um, sort of spinning cycles where you claw it back and then they respend it and then you claw it back and then they respend it um Ooh. which is huh. like yeah it's like it's like you it's like the whole thing is like well at least no one was able to um at least no one was able to take my money no one has it we're just endlessly spending it it's slowly getting drained away by fees to like keep spending it um I did not know vault technology was this complex. Like, I mean, on my Coinbase account, I see the vault option and I think I put a little bit in there, but I thought that was just like a very shallow technical feature of just a waiting period before the money gets released. So you're telling me it's deep down in the blockchain level as a smart contract. No, this is, so this is a specific contract that you'd have to write. So most Bitcoin, um, most Bitcoin transactions don't use this level of, um, 
protection. It's something that you have to explicitly oh, write okay. into your Bitcoin transactions. So what so Coinbase calls a vault is probably not as sophisticated as what you're talking about. That's probably just an account feature with a time delay at a uh, straight. Okay. All right. So I don't use it. I would this. bet so. Yeah, I mean, they might do it on the blockchain level, but I highly, I kind of doubt it because- As far like, as I know, all it is is a 48 hour waiting period to make a transaction. So if I want to move the money to another wallet, I have to wait 48 hours, something like that. Yeah, that sounds like something they've done at like their, their end of it okay. and not- Plus it's like, an exchange oh, and uh, anything I store there, I don't control the keys anyway. So it's almost like moot. It's already a third party in the loop. Yeah. Oh, but right. should- uh, uh, use this opportunity to boost one of our uh, mutual friends. So Joe Kelly and his team at Unchained Capital, I think you met them, they were at the Austin um, WeFactor camp. So they um, have this Unchained Capital, which has a multi-sig wall wallet feature. So you do control your keys, but there's like, uh, there's three keys. So you, an Unchained holds one of them. So it's like a pretty secure uh, wallet slash vault like solution. So I haven't looked into full details of it, but I'm actually yeah. considering I, I'm sick of hardware wallets. So I'm kind of thinking um, uh, I might try them out or something. But uh, yeah, yeah, I think Blockstream's wallet, the green wallet, also has like a two of two multi sig thing that, or two of three multi sig thing that they do and they email you backups. So you can do like email backups too. Um, but I think like so that vaults are like interesting, right? And this is like the thing with. Um, I don't know if privacy is the right word for it, but um, like protection, right? Like it's this weird access problem. Like you need to be able to get it out, but you also need the ability to like revert back. Like, I, I don't know, to me, like the added complexity of it seems like I would most likely shoot myself in the foot than like actually get any like- Ah, yeah. Um, the ability to shoot yourself in the foot seems much greater than a normal thing. So I like kind of shy, shy away from it. Like big security, I don't know, secure, like super secure stuff. So like there's this like um, hardware wallet called Cold Card, which people seem to really like. I have one that I've been meaning to set up for a few months now. I think I can pull it out. Um, cold Card wallet. Uh, oh, okay. It says coin kite, but it's a cold card. Yeah, I think, I don't know even know what version this is. Um, but it's got like little, um, you know, you lose like a micro SD to transfer your data to it so that you don't ever actually plug it in. So it's like actually offline and doesn't get like connected. Oh, to wow. The, okay. The That's thing at all. strong um, air gapping. Yeah. But like this one in particular, like if you forget what your key is, it's got like a pin you have to type in in order to unlock the wallet, which makes sense. Um, the thing about it that worries me is that I forget my pins all the goddamn time. And this one self-destructs. If you forget your pin, so it's like a $90 piece of hardware that if you forget your pin and try like four or five times, it like, it works itself. You can't. Oh, wow. That, that's harsh. But I think all wallets do something like that, right? Like I think Ledger does a dub time doubling. So each time you enter the wrong pin, the time you have to wait to try again increases. And it's like, that's a, like within like a, a hundred tries, it'll become like impossibly long or something. Oh, I see. Yeah, so there are such protections with everything. Uh, but I think this goes to the sort of fundamental trade-off of all sort of what I think of as postmodern technology versus modern technology. And the dividing line is actually crypto. Like, I, I think the, okay. this connects back to our previous topic of values. So values and walls. Uh, so I think the governing value of 20th century technology was convenience. Like everything, make it as convenient as, convenient as possible even mm -hmm. if it makes things fragile or insecure or like otherwise vulnerable. Whereas everything about the postmodern sort of digital age is connected to like highly inconvenient shit, like passwords, for example, like forget crypto with its you know, multiple layers of security, like just regular registrations and accounts on anything. There's like janky password stuff and it's the most inconvenient thing in anybody's life right now, just having to deal with passwords. And if you do like a password manager, then you have the other problem of a single point failure. And, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I think in many ways, uh, once we get truly into the digital era, we'll realize that the digital era, it's governing value is the opposite of um, the industrial era, which is, you know, convenience is traded for inconvenience. And it's going to be a very inconvenient time until we can figure out, uh, I don't know, a more convenient way to do security and crypto stuff. 
it's like every way of see, doing it I've seen is like annoying and requires yeah. a lot of infrastructure literacy and a small misstep could like lose you a lot of value. So yeah, it's, a, it's an inconvenient age. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. So I think I see what you're saying. We're kind of entering like this weird middle inter interreg interregnum. I can't. Yeah, yep. interregnum. Um, yeah, interregnum where like the the security is there, but the um, the actor, the actions, like the theater around it, so to speak, is like a little procedural or like. Yeah, and it it doesn't work well enough to be convenient. And I think there's some fundamental features of it that make it incapable of convenience. Like fundamentally convenience is a security flaw. Like anything that is built on convenience is a security flaw of some sort, right? Um, like I was just thinking this used telescope I just acquired, like when I was last into amateur astronomy, I was in high school and we didn't have all these fancy computerized technology telescopes. Right. So it was just a basic telescope. I, I would like hand steer and point at the moon or something. And this thing, it's got like a little computer, you enter the object you want and it slews automatically to that star or planet, but you have to like align it at first. And oh, yeah. it's yeah. got like, it's a 10 year old telescope. So it's got an obsolescence thing. And this is like, there's an annoyance factor to it. Like because software has eaten telescope navigation, it's no longer sort of an enduring piece of technology where like, it's not like riding a bike. It's like, all right, the software updates and firmware updates to this thing and annoying alignment and calibration and environment setting things going on. Yeah, so yeah. That seems to happen to everything that software eats. It adds this layer of inconvenience, but that gives you like a whole universe of other sorts of convenience. Like this is at another level. If it works, if you get it set up right, you don't need to know anything about astronomy or the constellations to use it. You can just type in Jupiter and it'll find Jupiter and point at it. That's incredible. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I know how all that works. I wrote, I've written some of that software once upon a time. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Cause the whole moon clock thing I did, I wrote all oh, of Oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah. You did that. Yeah. We should talk about it. To figure out where the moon is and you have to figure out where the moon is in order to figure out how much of the, the crescent to do. Um, I think the moon is actually one of the more complicated things to find in the sky because yes. of the way that, things work I don't know mm -hmm. I mean there's like a book someone wrote that's like here's all it's called astronomical algorithms and yeah, it's, you just I mean the hard part was figuring out how to put them all together to make it work as, as yeah it's program. annoying and fussy and um, oh yeah since uh, this is one of the few things I have some technical knowledge of since I took um, an orbital mechanics a couple of classes in grad school so I, I've done a lot of these calculations and the thing about orbital calculations is that they're kind of messy and very sensitive and it's like higher order integration of differential equations and small errors will mount and screw up. And you can see that in the technology. It's like this thing, this telescope I got, it's basically a database of bright objects and you have to point it at three stars and it sort of figures out and aligns itself. But small errors in time or anything and the calibration is off and it's annoyingly off. It doesn't work. So yeah. You're off by like, yeah. And it's, you know, it's kind of interesting in terms of like finic it's like a sensitivity of the system, like the inputs have to, how precise your inputs have to be in order to get good results. Um, yeah. Astronomy yeah. Like if your clock is off by a little bit, like when you set up this telescope, you have to give it its location and local time and location. It's not that sensitive. I just said Los Angeles. Time, if you get it off by like a oh, no, 10 minutes, you're off. Well. Like the telescope yeah. will be way off. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> no, I totally believe that. Having done this moon stuff, yeah, the time is like utmost importance. Um, yeah, I'll bring my telescope to show and tell at some point in the future. And we should, yeah, that sounds great. Um, what was that? Was like one other thing I wanted to say. Oh, the other interesting thing about astronomical um, algorithms is that, kind of as you were saying, like how they're finicky, they only like because of the way that we calculate them, we don't have like a generalized description of like the movement of everything. A lot of them are like these like approximations that are like, they have like every calculation of how a orbit works is a, um, a it's like approximated and they all totally, have like, yep. they all have like expiration dates and they're like, okay, this is this like algorithm and these numbers for these inputs is good until 2000 years from now. And like at 2000 years from now, these will no longer be valid. We'll have to like, you'll have to redo all of them because the, um, the 
validity of it like decays over time or something. Yeah, I mean, like when you study this in a course, the way they teach you is the basic calculation that's easy to do and very elegant is uh, two body mechanics, like two bodies and gravitational thing. Then you add three bodies and you can no longer do close form anything and it's like annoying. Then you have to add obliqueness correction and corrections and like tidal forces and other crap and each layer adds like more and more approximations and therefore it goes out to longer time horizons. So a fifth, five or six factor equation will take you out much longer, but it'll be ugly and messy. So Yeah, they're super fucking messy. There's and like yeah. most of it, like most of coding this stuff up was just translating tables into the thing because it's like you have all these tables of values that are like coefficients for different things. And then at some point all those coefficients are like they're they, they all expire. Um yep. so like I think like I mean you're saying like you're you're telescope software has an expiration date and maintenance, but like the whole underlying system also needs maintenance. Like, Yeah, so the telescope, it's mainly sort of calibration error while setting it up. I don't think um, pointing a telescope, low power telescope in the sky requires that much sensitivity, but yeah, anything will, higher like order. In 2000, in 2000 years, it's not gonna point at the right thing no matter how well you Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Up. I don't think it will take like in you know, a procession of uh, the pole star and things like that into account. So yeah, it, it'll, it's good for like maybe, I would say another 100 years. It, that's probably what the software is coded for. But this stuff, it's like, it's a lot of fun when the sensitivity and sort of craft works in your favor. And my favorite anecdote about that is uh, this Japanese space mission, um, their first moon mission, of Hayabusa, or no, that might be a different one. I forget what it was called, but their first moon mission, when it first launched, um, they kind of got the initial orbit a little bit uh, wrong and they ended up using too much fuel in the first few orbit corrections and they didn't have enough to get to the moon. And a guy at JPL suggested a hack which was if you resolve the equations, which are three body problems, you've got earth, moon, and spacecraft, it's a three body system. If you resolve the system of equations with a four, as a four body problem by adding the sun into the equations, it doesn't change the nominal solution by much, but what it does is it, if you, it allows a new kind of really complex trajectory where it gets into this region of space, which is kind of like a chaotic boundary between the earth and moon gravitational fields where small disturbances can kind of like replace fuel. So this is kind of uh, now a really well-known orbital tactic where you can use, if you don't have enough fuel, you can basically use chaos theory and a fourth body to get captured by the moon. And the, it, the mission took like 30 or 40 days longer because of this, because yeah. the new orbit was weird shaped, but um, they salvaged the mission, which would otherwise have been impossible with the amount of fuel they had left on board. So yeah, astronomy is fun. Yeah, that's really cool, huh? Cool stuff. All yeah. right. All right. So I think is that our last V topic? Somehow we got from walls to astronomy calculations. Yeah, somewhere. I mean, this show is a little vaudevillian, like uh, we <laughs> all over the map. Um, hey, it won't be properly vaudevillian until you start singing and I start doing a stand-up routine or something. So we we've got to we got to set the yeah, bar for vaudeville a little higher. You know, the thing with singing that I struggle with is like I don't know what song. song I'm not good with songs. We we'll have to pick a song some other day, I think. But <laughs> I kid, you don't have to sing if you don't want to. We'll, we we can start inviting musical guests. Huh? That would make musical guests, yeah. Like good. SNL. Like, yeah, we could do that. No. Yeah. Oh no! Oh no! Okay. <laughs> We're like we are approaching like vaudeville at that point, you know, like uh, me, like modern vaudeville and. Yeah. I totally want to go there. I want, like, if we can get there, I want this to be a show that's a mix of like house hunting and DIY crap and junkyard show and tell with a little bit of vaudeville and music and dance and uh, out your director hat I see here, like uh, getting back into that old role. Okay. Cool. That would be fun to do. Yeah. If we can find uh, the right talent and I don't know, show and tell junk. I'll leave that to you then, then Kat. All right. Cool. Yeah, I'm going to rope you into it as well. You have a clearly a lot of um, show and tell available to play. Right. All um, right. Cool. Well, it's always a pleasure, and I'll catch you next week. See you next week. Bye. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. 
Check out their next generation screen technology at smokinscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.